Well, again, welcome. Happy Independence Day. Amen. Isn't it good to live in a free country? Yeah. Hallelujah. God has been so good to me. Has he been good to anybody else in here? Yeah. Come on. I mean, we go through some stuff. I know we, we go through, uh, you know, some tribulations and trials and some suffering. But aren't you glad that God's with you? Yeah. Well, whenever I go through things, it's like... Wow, thank you, Lord, for you're with me. Even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Amen? I won't be afraid because you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And when I see people going through stuff and they don't know God, it's like, how can you go through this? That's why, they, that's why their, their lives are going crazy. Whenever they have so much chaos going on, they're not walking with the Prince of Peace. Because it rains on the just and the unjust. Y'all know that. It, it, it happens to good people and to people that are not so good. I mean, Job, it, Job was blameless and upright before the Lord. But yet, the enemy was able to come in, the hedge was moved away, and he lost everything he had. And y'all know what Job did? He shaved his head, he looked like Pastor Mark. And he fell down and he worshiped God. And because he worshiped God, the devil got mad and came at him some more. Attacked him personally. And he had balls on his body and his pain. And I mean, he, he was under attack. And guess what he did? He worshiped God. And his wife was standing there by him. And you know what his wife said to him? Why don't you curse God and die? Why are you holding on to your integrity? Because God's more important than all these things. When we get the revelation that God is not the one who takes life, that God is the one who gives life, we'll worship him. That's why when we lose a loved one, don't get mad at God and separate yourself from God because God's the one that's keeping them for you to be with them. Amen? Amen? When tragedy comes, they'll say, well, well, you know, I don't believe in a God anymore. Well, you're going to miss out on eternity with the ones you love. God knows more than you. How many of y'all know that? Amen. How many of y'all believe that God really loves you? We just sing about it. I'm, I really want to be where he is. Amen. And you know, for, for the Christian, death means a transition from this life to eternal life. Now the world and the devil will try to lie to you and say there's no such thing as life after death. That you're just dead, dead. Listen to me very plainly. There's no such thing as dead, dead. You go on living. And uh, I actually was watching, uh, while I was studying this week, I was watching uh, a video of a bunch of... Uh, Important people, professors and PhDs and you know, got all them letters after their name and all that. And they were being challenged with all the scientific proof that people live after they die. Because when they die, they have these near-death experiences that they have all of these amazing experiences that they cannot explain. I mean, it's unbelievable. Some of the stuff that they shared, that they've discovered... That people that die here know something that's going on across the country. I mean, there's one story. I'm just going to give you this little story. One story. This woman was on, having open heart surgery, and, and she died for a little while. And she had a friend, and she said, who was alive when she was supposed to be alive when she was in surgery. And when she came back, she said, my friend met me. And talk to him and says, tell my mom and dad I'm sorry I wrecked the, the new sports, the red sports car that they bought, they bought me and that I love them. She had no idea the wreck happened while she was having surgery. And she knew something that happened over there. And, and listen, I, I work with hospice. There's so many times there's the, the, the patient, when they're, they're coming to the end of their life, they're talking to people that's not in the room. And this isn't every now and then, guys. Dan knows. 
I work with Jan, we work together. This happens all the time. And then it's unexplainable. And then they're, they're talking to their loved ones that have gone on before them and, and they're not in the room. And, they're like, and then some of them, they can have, uh, uh, this happened to me a couple of times, they can have Alzheimer's or they're not able to communicate and they haven't really communicated with their family. And there's this one man I went to uh, ICU years and years ago and I didn't know how sick he was. I did, this is before I was actually working with hospice. And I went in to ICU and when I went in and I started, I said, I've come to pray for you. He said, he, he woke up and I talked to him and we prayed together. He accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He told me a few things to tell my family I love him and all that. And then I walked out and I said, man, I had a great talk with your grandfather. He said, my grandfather hadn't talked in over like two months. What do you mean? I said, when I walked in there, he, he was talking to me just like you're talking to me. What you talking about? He, he came, see, that, that's beyond what science can, can describe. His, his mind was greater than his brain. His brain was shutting down, but his mind, his soul was still able to make peace, bring some closure. Amen? Amen? I mean, come on, there ain't no such thing as dead, dead. Amen. I'm a believer. I've been with people and hold, holding their hands that are believers and they, when they leave this life and go to the next. And it's, when they're a believer, it's one of the most beautiful things you could ever see sometimes. Because they're getting out of this body that's got them trapped because your body is a mortal body and it gets older and eventually it's going to be broken down where it cannot hold your spirit anymore and it's going to be time to check out. And where are you going to check out to? I'm checking out to be with Jesus. Amen? Amen? So don't let the devil lie to you. He's a liar, by the way. And don't let the world system tell you that it's this way when it's not. Because you know what all of that does? It brings something into your life that, that if you don't deal with it, you're never going to really enjoy your Christian life. It brings doubt and unbelief into your life. And it's when you're doubting and you're not believing the word of God and the truth of God's promises, you, you become a miserable Christian. I'm, I'm going to kind of go a little, um, follow me up there. We're going to go to, uh, again, Mark eleven twenty three. 23. I want you to see something. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be thou cast into the sea and does not what? Doubt in his heart. But believes that those things he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. Some of y'all, faith isn't your problem. Y'all believe, but y'all believe with a doubting heart sometimes. Y'all confess it, but you still got that little bit of doubt in there. You know, and, and what brings that doubt into our lives is the world system is not going to build your faith because the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. He's got a plan every day of your life, spiritual warfare, to keep you from believing and trusting God and living a life of faith without doubt. He wants you to doubt. And so our five physical senses, which is connected to the world, the natural things, we start looking at things in the natural and so when, when we hear a report in the natural, instead of believing what God says, we believe the report of the world. Yes. I know it might sound silly, but we're fixing to come, you know, summer's going to be over, fall's going to be here, and the world's going to tell you it's flu season. Yeah. Yeah. They, I mean, honestly, and when, but God says, by his stripes you're healed. He sent his word and healed you and delivered you out. But we doubt God's word and we believe. And I know that there's going to be a flu, the, the flu virus fl flies around. And, and you know, but why don't you stand on God's word? And I, I'm not against doctors. I, I, that's obvious. Amen? Amen. I'm not against medicine and all those kind of things. But put your trust in God while you're going through anything that attacks you. You're a well person, a healed person, fighting against the sickness that's trying to attack you from the enemy. 
And he wants to attack you first in your mind. He wants you to doubt God's promises. The power of your words are, I mean, I've, I've, I've taught several weeks on that. And, and one of the things I know that how it works is from the time I was a little boy, my daddy used to say over and over, he said, I know that if I just make it to 50 years old, I'm going to be satisfied. He kept talking about dying at, at 50 years old. Guess how old he was when he died? 50 years old. And right, uh, just three weeks before he dies, he's going around telling everybody that by and making peace with everybody. It's like he already planned he was checking out at 50 years old. He didn't know how. He got on the open heart table, open heart surgery table, and there they cut his aorta and he hemorrhaged to death on the table. It was supposed to be a routine open heart surgery if, there, if there's such a thing. We told him bye when he went in and he never came out. Just his body did. Come on. I, I, I like what Psalms 91 says. With long life, he will satisfy me and show me my salvation. But you see, the enemy, see there's the enemy. How many of y'all know there's the enemy? He's going to come and he wants to get you depressed, oppressed. He wants to demonize you. And some of y'all, some of us, we get depressed and, and all of a sudden, I'm just going to give up. He's got you. Don't give up. Somebody say hallelujah, say, I'm free. free. I'm not giving up. See, you're free to make a decision. And the power and the will to live is one of the most, is one of the greatest things I've ever seen in my life. Yes. And I'm, I'm talking from experience. There could be somebody, and I'm going to talk a little bit more, uh, Jan knows, somebody that, that's sick and, and it looks like they're going to pass away today and we, they call all the family together, but she ain't ready to go today. So two days goes by, three days goes by, four days goes by, five days goes by, and finally uh, the, the nephew or somebody or, or the grandson shows up. It's like she's been waiting for, for the grandson to show up. The grand, that happened with my, with, with my, my mom when, when David, her grandson, showed up. Fifteen minutes later, she was gone. He flew in from uh, Japan to, be, to see her before she passed. She was waiting to see David. And the will to live, or what she wanted... It, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. But you can also give up. Yeah. And some, with faith, sometimes that's what happens. You'll have a loved one that's, that's real sick and their pain, all this is going on. They say, I'm ready. And some, I've talked to some of them as a, as a chaplain. When they say they're ready, they're ready. Like, and I mean, they talk so positively about their faith and the Lord and the afterlife and you know, that, that's like, they, they ready. I, mean, I said, well, I'm ready to go with you. Let's hold hands and go on in and be with Jesus, you know. That's how strong their faith is. But when you doubt, it, the doubting keeps the promises of God from manifesting in your life. So sometimes we need to not just work on our faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But doubting comes from hearing the evil report. The wrong report that there's no way out when God says with every temptation every test God says I will make a way of escape Amen. so if if we do not doubt in our heart but believe that those things we say will have whatever we say doubt unbelief again the devil is a liar and so whenever you believe in God, when you want to trust in God's promises, we've got to get out of our mind that, that uh, the only way we can get what God promised is if we're perfect and we're holy and we're, you know, uh, you know Mr. Goody Two-Shoes, we don't ever do nothing wrong. That, that, that's baloney. You cannot earn the promises of God. It's all by the grace of God that you have anything that you have. Now let's start with verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, when problems come. That's what he's talking about. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. 
How many of y'all love patience? Uh, you need to learn to exercise your patience. You don't need any more patience. You got it. Just exercise it, okay? Amen. So whenever it's, things are slowing you down, you say, this is a good opportunity to exercise my patience. Pastor Mark does that all the time. Uh, repent for lying. And let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. If anyone lacks wisdom, how many of y'all need to know a few things? Let him ask of God who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. Let him ask in faith, listen, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like the waves of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. When, so you, you release your faith, but you got to deal with your doubt. You got to believe what God says more than the report. And you begin to act on it. Now he says, he's going to go on to say, we're tossed to and fro. Like he says, uh, and then he says, for let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. When we let doubt in, we stop our receiver. You got to believe that you receive it and you shall have it. But whenever you don't believe that you're worthy of it, that's doubting. And therefore you're going to stop what God has for you. One of the greatest revelations I got in my entire Christian life, I'm fixing to give to you. And if you get this, you can, you, it's gonna, it can change your life. Some of y'all know this. I realized that whenever I got born again, when I became a son of God, that my spirit was made perfect. My spirit got saved. And you need to know that. God is spirit, and when he saved you, he saved your spirit. But your soul is still getting worked on, and your body is going to be worked on. Your soul has not been saved totally yet. That's why it's called the renewing of the mind, the submission of the will, not my will, but thy will be done, and the, the giving of your emotions, your feelings to God, to let him change those things. We're not supposed to walk by what we feel because I don't feel good about everything every day. And so the world system is going to, what, what, what is the world? All that is in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's all to attack your soul, to pull you away so you're not being led by the Spirit. The reason I can receive anything from God is because I am holy, I am righteous in my spirit. Amen. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, but my spirit is, my soul, when I look in the mirror and I look at myself, I look at my body, that, that man doesn't seem to be the righteousness of God, but that's more to him than just what you see. Amen. And once you realize that your spirit, man, is the most powerful thing in you, and your spirit is righteous, your spirit is holy, your spirit is joined to the Lord's spirit, you are one spirit with him according to the word of God, and in your spirit you cannot sin and you will not sin. Amen. Therefore, I receive not from out here receive from the spirit of God that's on the inside of me right here and I need to let him flow through me if the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in your mortal body he shall quicken your mortal body he'll make it alive is what it says in John chapter 8 I mean uh, Romans chapter 8 your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's spirit, that eternal life, is in you and he has joined it to your spirit and you are an eternal being. And this isn't something he just decided to make up as he went on. God made provision for everything you need before he even made you. Now y'all get that in you. That, that's good right there. He created the heavens and the earth. He created everything. The last thing he created was man. In Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every creeping thing that creeps on the face of the earth. Then it goes on and says, God blessed him and said to him, be fruitful and multiply. He took him and put him in the garden. And when he, he didn't say, well, once he made man, he said, oh, you know what? I think I'm going to have to feed him. Let's plant some trees. The trees were already planted. Oh, he's going to need air. Let me make some air. Nope, there was already air there. 
He's going to need to drink. Let's make some water. No, he already made the seas and the, the rivers. and He made everything that was needed for man before he ever put man in there. He says, I know what you have need of. He says, I, I know it before you even ask me. Not just, he, he, God is able to supply your needs. Oh, uh, but maybe there's no God. Well, isn't it pretty amazing how all this stuff works good uh, from some big explosion? Darwinism, you go, you, they want to believe in the theory instead of the truth. We're talking about being set free today. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So he says, uh, this man is double-minded, unstable in all of his ways, verse 8. Then he goes on to talk about how temptation comes. And it's not God tempting you. The devil's the tempter, but he's going to tempt you with those things that you desire. God can't tempt you with something you don't like. Y'all get that? I mean, if you, if you hate drugs, he's not going to tempt you with drugs. But you might love money, so he'll tempt you with money. Go with me to uh, John uh, chapter 8, verse 31. John 8, 31. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, who believed, if you abide in my words, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Now, John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come unto the Father except through me. This is eternal life, that you may know him, Jesus Christ. Amen? So when you know the truth, the truth shall set you free. How many hours in your life have you spent on this, learning this book? If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, how much time are you finding out what God actually says to you? If we really believe it's true and that it will work in our lives when we receive it and believe it, we ought to go digging in it to find out what it says. Amen. I've been saved over 30 years. I've spent a lot of hours in this book. And I'm going to tell you right now, when I believe it, it works. Amen. When I doubt it, it doesn't work so good. But I'm going to tell you right now, I can give you some testimonies of what God has done for me. And I'm going to tell you, he's not finished with me yet. He's going to continue to do more. Amen. And when God blesses me, some people don't like it. You know how much I don't care what they think. So when you start talking about the goodness of God, the people who don't really believe it, the doubters, right. will want to attack you. Amen. Amen. I'm not, you don't have to agree with me unless I agree with you, unless you, I'm, I'm preaching a word, then you should agree, but if you don't, that's your problem. Amen. That means you're doubting what it says. Amen. You shall know the truth. Now that word know, y'all know what it means, like Adam knew Eve and she conceived it means to become one with, to become intimate with the truth, to really know Jesus Christ, that is eternal life. You shall know Jesus, and Jesus will set you free. Amen. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, shall make you free. And that's what it goes on to say. Let's keep reading what it says right here. And they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants, and have never been in bondage to anyone. <laughs> bondage. How many of you know that's the opposite of freedom? Y'all, somebody say amen, please. Amen. Act like y'all listen a little bit. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. They say we haven't been in bondage to anyone. You know what's, the, what's really bad is when you're in bondage and you don't even know it. It's when you're locked in a jail and you don't even realize the door's unlocked and you're living in there. Bondage. Y'all know what religion, the definition of religion is? I actually looked it up again last night to make sure. Because I preached and I said, I don't want to preach this. I want to make double sure that, that I did learn this in Bible college and I've studied it before. Religion means to return to bondage. Yes. 
the, it comes down to, to bind oneself to. Now, true religion is to bind yourself to God. Yes. True religion is to make yourself one and become a bond slave of Jesus Christ. But whenever your religion is to bind yourself to a doctrinal system, you're putting yourself back into bondage. Jesus Christ doesn't ask you to follow a doctrinal system. He wants you to follow him. He's a person. Amen? So we don't want to be putting ourselves back into bondage when you should follow the truth, make yourself one with the truth. And that is true in undefiled religion. It's to really know him. It says to help the orphans and the, uh, the widows and to keep oneself unspotted by the world. It says that in James. Only place where religion is used in the Bible that I, I can recall. Okay? They're in bondage. You know what they're in bondage to? To the freedom that they think they have in their Judaism. The law, they think they're free because they know the law and the law was given to them. But all the law can do is put you in more bondage. We've been set free from the law. I'm talking about scriptural law. Amen? Amen. Keeping the Ten Commandments doesn't get you in heaven. Believing in Jesus Christ is what gets you in heaven. And he wants you to keep the Ten Commandments. Breaking them is not good because there's consequences to that. But no one can keep the commandments, so that's why Jesus Christ came. He realized that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That we all was going to break at least one, but when you break one, you've broken them all. That's what he says. So the, these uh, Jewish people are saying to him, we have uh, never been in bondage to anyone. How can you, you say you will be made free? And Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Now when you got born again, you became a son and a daughter of God, and you will abide forever in the house of God. Okay? And you got to deal with your soul, get, get your mind, your will, your emotions submitted to God, and wait for your glorified body. Amen? It's coming. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, who's going to make you free? If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I'm free, hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. Because the Son has set me free. Let me give you a few things here. What am I free from? Freedom from the power of sin. Sin does not have dominion over me whenever I have Christ. And where sin abounds, his grace so much more abounds. Free from old habits, from gossip, adultery, idolatry, sexual immorality, lying, and the list can go on and on. Unforgiveness, bitterness, offense. Be free. Don't walk around with all that stuff in your heart just dragging you down. I've been freed from the power of sin. Number two, I've been freed from the penalty of sin. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Because when you do sin, the curse comes. We can read that in Deuteronomy 28. You got the blessings for obedience and the curse for disobedience. And also the penalty of sin, if you've never been under the blood of Jesus, is eventually a place called hell. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He became a curse for you that you would receive the blessing of God. He paid the price so that you don't receive the wrath of God. I don't have to endure the penalty of sin because Jesus is my victory. Y'all got that? He is my victory and my salvation is based totally upon him. Not upon me or you or any religion. It's upon him. I put my faith totally in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his ascension, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And when you're a Christian, you're free. Jesus' sacrifice has set you free. He sacrificed everything. Come on, do y'all realize he stepped out of glory, became a man, went to the cross? Even before Adam and Eve sinned, it says Jesus was crucified before the foundations of the world. God made provision before we, man ever even sinned. 
This doesn't take God by surprise. Sin is not a big deal to God. He took care of it on the cross. It was a big deal that day whenever Jesus was on the cross bearing it. But now your faith in him pleases God. How many of y'all believe that your sins are forgiven? Woo, that's exciting stuff. Whenever I first got saved, I was like, all my sins can be washed away. But the devil wants to make sure you, every time you look at the slate of your life, that you see all your sins. Lying devil. And see, all that does is complicate your, your heart, your mind. It clutters it and it gives you doubt. Because if you're looking at your life and, and your whiteboard, let's say, of your life is still filled with stuff, anger, bitterness, and your sins, and your past, and all those kind of things, and you're trying to believe God, God's promises don't want to fit on there because it's cluttered with all the junk. Let the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, wipe that slate clean. So that what you write on there is who God says you are instead of what the world says or what the devil says. Or even what your conscience says. The Bible says if your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart. But if your heart doesn't condemn you, you have confidence towards God. God's not here to condemn you. God's here to set you free. He wants to wipe that slate clean. And that's what sets you free. Say, I'm free. Come on, my slate, my slate got wiped clean, and whenever some junk tries to get on it, I get to wipe her out again. It's called repent, amen? Confess your sin, he's faithful and just, to forgive your sin, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Because once I wipe all that stuff off, I can, I can see, son of God, healed, delivered, prosperous, victorious. Amen? amen. I don't have to believe everything everybody else says. And, and you know, and, and whenever, like Stacy and I, we, we, we're married, so we interact more than anybody else in our lives, and we're trying to get our tongue under control, and we'll hear each other say stuff that we know we shouldn't be saying. But you know, I, I, I don't feel excited whenever she tells me I'm not talking right. I know. I know. Y'all know what I mean? But you know what? Whenever I'm saying something that's incorrect, or she said something, and, and you know, like, uh, we, what, what I preach, I try to live too, y'all know that. Because I'll say something, she says, oh, if you say so, I'm like, thank you for that. <laughs> Nothing ever goes right. If you say so, well, I, 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 I rebuke that, I repent of that. That's why you got to watch what words are spoken to you and over you. And you don't receive stuff that drags you down. And you deal with it and you say who you are in Christ. It says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against me, I shall condemn. I can't receive it. When we first got married, we had a wonderful prophecy given to us, written on a, two sheets of paper about how... Oh, we miss God and this is going to happen and this bad thing going to All just negative stuff that was going to be happening in me and Stacy's lives. <laughs> False prophecy. Come on. I, I still tested it. I called the people I can trust in the Lord. I called Philip. How many of you know Philip Baker? Yeah. I read it to him. He doesn't even know who wrote it, but he described this person to the T. <laughs> He said, that's a religious person that's been in your church that wanted to get up and talk and one time you didn't let them talk and they're mad at you. I'm like, how you knew that? He could discern it right away. Amen. So I, I don't let those words come into my heart. Amen. Amen? Everything everybody says to you is not God. Amen. Even if they say, thus says the Lord. Y'all do realize that, huh? Well, let me tell you what the Lord showed me about you. Okay, get ready. Because if not edification, exhortation, and comfort to you, it's not a prophecy from the Lord. Amen. Now sometimes, somebody's going to tell you something you don't like, but it's true. And you know it's true, but we don't like it when we first hear it. But when you know the truth, the truth will make you free. Amen. That's the difference. 
that's iron sharpens iron. Accountability, that's right. And that's how you grow. So it's, it's a balance. But watch out, the devil uses people to try to pull you down. Why do you think that scripture said, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that rises up against me, I shall condemn. Now, y'all know words are seeds? So the longer you let that stuff, you know, get in you, y'all know what I'm talking about? You, and you start worrying about it, thinking about it, it's germinating. Amen. And it's trying to get roots down in there. And you know what that does? It produces doubt in your life. When God says, I want you blessed, and somebody's trying to tell you that you're not going to be blessed, I I'll take the blessing side. How about you? Yeah. Blessed is the man who puts his trust in the Lord. He's like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Yes. He's like a shrub in the wilderness. I'd rather be a tree by the living water than a shrub in the wilderness. Yeah. You know what that is? It's a tumbling weed is what a shrub in the wilderness. It just, yeah. wherever the wind blows is where it goes. Do I get anything out of this today? Amen. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Okay, the next thing, number three. I am now, because of the gospel, freedom from the presence of sin. That's, that's where I'm going to eventually be. I'm not there yet. But do you all know that once you're glorified, say glorification. That's once you leave this life and you enter into eternity. It's a place called heaven. That God's prepared for, we will be free from the presence of sin and Satan. Amen? Amen. You know, the Bible says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, Amen. but against principalities and powers, rules of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wick, wickedness in heavenly places. So, but do y'all realize that the enemy does use people? And you know, the, the church can say, well, does that mean they're oppressed, depressed, possessed? No, the word is demonized. When it talks about somebody being possessed, of what they're being demonized, it means a devil's in their life trying to destroy their life and destroy the ones around them. So the enemy will use other people. But you've got to separate. So when somebody's attacking you, don't attack them back. Pray for them. Amen. And love the person so that the enemy that's using them has no power over your life. What do you think Jesus was doing on the cross? They are torturing him and he looks, he says, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. When somebody's hurting you or doing something against you, or can you say, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do? Amen. That's maturity in Christ. Amen. And that's going to set you free from being in bondage. Amen. Freedom from the presence of sin. And why did Jesus Christ do all this? Because he loves us. He wants us to be free and have a free will. That's how important this is to him. The ability to, to choose. I've meditated on this many times. Once I check out of this world and I'm with the Lord, which is going to be a long time from now, Amen. 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 Will I still be able to make my own choice? I mean, I'm going to be in heaven. Uh, there, there's going to be no sin there. And sin basically is you choosing other than God's will for your life. That's why I think we're down here right now. We're on a practice run. And when we get to heaven, we're going to find out every time we made the wrong decision that we're going to say... Boy, I shouldn't have made that decision, and you're going to decide to always decide what God wants for you. If he takes away our free will in heaven, then we won't be able to genuinely love him. But you know what he's going to do? He's going to give us the desire, because it says he gives us the desire and the power to do what's pleasing to him. But you're going to have to ask for it. And it starts now. Lord, give me the desire and the power to do what's pleasing to you. Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Amen? Because yes. you can't do this without the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't do any of it without the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And therefore, when we're in 
glory when we're in heaven, we can always choose to do what's pleasing to God. Amen? I believe that. Once we see him and, and see how wise and how amazing his grace is, and to see all of these stories that the world thinks is a bunch of foolishness is going to show us his true character and nature, the depth of his love. And when he's going to remove all of the things of the tempter, the devil's going to be cast in the lake of fire. And there's going to be that great separation, the judgment of God, the white throne judgment of God. And we're going to see him in his loving glory. My goodness, all you're going to want to do is worship him. When you get the revelation, I know we, we, we don't realize how long eternity is, but when we get to it, it's going to be amazing. Guys, your time is running out down here. Make a decision for Christ. Amen. Make a decision to do what he's called you to do. Amen. But when we get to heaven, time never runs out. You can be patient because you've got a lot of time in heaven. Amen?